You're recording. Welcome everybody to Marla and Mary's mar monthly market update <laughs> as when we um, review the market and what's going on in Chicago real estate. Uh, and if you've got any questions for us, um, our friend Jerry is monitoring the chat box. So put your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to, to answer them. Um, in addition to the market, we're going to um, cover the Ten Commandments of a loan application and what not to do. So, <laughs> how are you this month, Marla? How have you been? What's going on? Just super busy. I mean, of course, rates are still ridiculously low, so everybody is wanting a loan, whether it's buying a house or refinancing. So we are staying incredibly busy, which is good for everyone, good for people saving I saw money. That you, uh, I saw that you had put out a request for a loan processor. Did you find somebody or are you still uh, I, we have about a dozen applications that we're filtering through. So it's a, yeah, it's a junior loan processor position. So entry level, um, we're still reviewing applications. So if anyone watching is interested, it is a full-time work from home position. <laughs> but yeah, we are so busy. We are adding staff. That's pretty what, much what, that's world. That's great. What, I mean, what kind of qualifications or experience are you looking so, for? So yeah, it's, base, it's a basic office position. So there's phone calling, emailing, basic organization ability to follow a checklist, but basically everything can be trained on the job. So it doesn't need specific mortgage background or anything like that. Just basic office skills and good communication, you know, those sort of things. So yeah, it's entry level and the person could move up to be a full processor, not a junior processor or even an underwriter if they want. So, so yeah, it's a good starting position. Would they be working specifically with you or just other people? In so they'd be working specifically with my team, but they'd technically be working under my processor, Tracy, who is incredibly skilled. So they would be in a really good position to learn a lot from her um, and get a lot of benefit out of that. Awesome. Great. Well, yeah, be sure if, you, if you're looking for work, be sure to reach out to Marla. It's uh, nice to hear that somebody's actually looking to hire in this market, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to quick run through the monthly uh, uh, the, the charts and graphs that I love to do. And um, let me go back and share my screen here. Um, wait a minute. Oh, wait, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, here we go. I think. Let me know if, um, if, the, if it comes up. Right? Are we good? Yeah. yeah we there good? we go. I see it. Okay, great. All right. So let me go back to the beginning. I'm at the end here. I was looking at this myself, actually. Oh, no. I want to make it full screen, too. Um, all right. So this is a monthly update that we get uh, through our MLS. They update it every Monday. And they've been doing this ever since we um, locked down. Uh, and it just has been really interesting to watch this as, as the market develops. Um, the blue bars are 2020. These are properties that have sold and closed. The green bars are 2019. And you can see that um, 2019 was actually ahead of us up until this is where we locked down right in here. Um, we, we had a nice spring market going, but all of a sudden, you know, we locked down. But look where we are now. This is, we are ahead of the 2019 market. These are actually sold and closed listings. Um, I wonder what happened that one week, that 7, July 27th to August 3rd. That week was so much, because if you take that out, you see it's pretty much flat for several weeks. But that one week really shot up. I wonder what, uh, what triggered that. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. So obviously, that was deals going under contract 30 to 45 days before that if they closed in that day. So what would have that been in the beginning of June? Maybe that was right around when lockdown ended and would have been getting back into looking at houses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, OK, so those are closed. These are under contract. And we can see that we clearly had our spring market this summer. <laughs> and we we are actually ahead of I believe we're ahead of 2019 all across the board in that regard. Yeah, it looks like, definitely looks like it. Yeah. 
know why. That would make sense why I'm working every day from sunup to sundown. <laughs> right, exactly, right? You're doing beautiful. Now I can see it on in nice blue, uh, blue bars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see, um, just to get some hard numbers, 4,800, 4,400 versus... So this one is under contract. These are under contract, not yet closed, but it tells us what's going on in the market right now, today. Whereas closed tells us really what happened in the market 30, 45 days right. ago. Um, this is new listings. Um, so okay, yeah, we, we locked down, people pulled their properties off the market. Um, we had a nice um, spring market in 2019, but not so much in 2020, but look where we are now. I mean, That's we, yeah, we've, we've definitely have caught up with, li with listings coming on the market. Yeah, and I mean, we could definitely use some more with the number of buyers out there. So if anyone watching is thinking of selling their home, please, we need houses to sell. And they're going fast and often for full list price or above list price. So if you're thinking of selling, this is definitely a great time to get a very nice price. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's all about having a price properly, right? But yeah, mm -hmm. the, the buyers, you know, the buyers will come in there. They, they have this idea that because we're in a recession and we're in a pandemic that they should be able to negotiate, but it's really not happening. So yeah, and I'm seeing buyers actually get better about that. Either their real estate agents are really coaching them on what it means to be in a seller's market, or they lose a couple of you know multiple bid situations, and then they get more realistic. So I'm right. seeing buyers even on their first one call me say, hey, I want to offer full list now. A lot of them are not starting lower with the idea of negotiating. So we were seeing that, but I think they're they're realizing how hot the market is, and if they want a house, they really have to pay what it's worth, which is fine. I mean, you know, some people are concerned, oh, I don't want to pay too much for it, but the fact that the interest rate is so low, they're still getting an amazing deal and going to save a ton of money. So it's still, even if you're paying higher than you would have a few months ago, it's still it's still a great opportunity. Well, you need to you need to give your pitch about. Um... <laughs> how with a lower interest rate you can buy that much more property so. oh a lot more yeah people are getting houses they previously didn't think they could they thought oh we have to you know wait and save a huge down payment before we can move up to that house with the right number of bedrooms or whatever and yeah people are able to do that a lot sooner now with those with the lower rates so yeah Right, right. And this is an interesting chart that I love to follow, too, because it shows the, the, the number of appointment requests, how many showings oh. we're having. So the navy blue line is 2019. And, and as would be expected, come summer, this is the 4th of July, no doubt. Yeah. See, I mean, come, you know, people are going on summer vacation, but but look how, how much up we are from 20. The, the gold line is 2020. The navy blue line is 2019. Um, we are actually, this, the zero represents the beginning of the year, showing, I mean, you know, this, this is 2019. This was um, uh, the polar vortex. <laughs> Yeah, people don't like that. <laughs> but this 2020, this is when we were locked, you know, shut down. Mm -hmm. um, but our, but our, uh, our showings are still up. Um, hi, hi, yeah. I mean, we're up 16% from last year and 13.5% before the, the pandemic yet. So, um, uh, yeah, so buyers are out there heavily looking yeah. to buy homes. Yep. Definitely, definitely uh, lots of activity. So and this is busier than it normally is in August. I always feel like August is a little slow because a lot of people go on vacation, but right. less people are doing vacations this year. Um, so they're still out shopping for homes. Well, I mean, the kids are, I don't know if, if kids are really going back to school per se. Um, you know, I mean, there's, I've seen things on Facebook where, they're going back to school in there in a, in a segregated part of the living room or <laughs> right. Bedroom. Yeah. Most of the schools around Chicago are uh, remote. There are a few that are live. I think maybe some of the religious or private schools, um, right. but yeah, most of them are remote. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have, I've seen pictures, people posting first day of school pictures with a nice shirt and pajama bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and it's hard to get away for your end of the summer vacation anyway. I mean, I guess now we can we can go to Wisconsin again. We don't have to be 
quarantine, but you know, I would have a tough time going to Wisconsin for a getaway and then have to come home and quarantine for 14 days. I know I, I wouldn't want to do that. And I imagine a lot of people feel the same, but yeah. So it's just, it's just not our normal year. And it's been very weird. It's been a very weird year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's understatement. But in any case, in real estate, it's been good for for real estate, the lockdown was a little it's slow, been, but now it's been. This is, what, this is the last slide that I want to show, and it shows what's happening to prices, mm. um, which is really interesting because, again, the, the the blue is is our current year, and the green is last year, and we are up. Our, this is a median sales price, um, mm. and the lines are average. Um, but look at here, the 2019 average sold price was, let's call it 300. It's up, it's up oh, wow. 10%. Three, that is a lot. I mean, yeah. that's a 10% increase over. Yeah. In, 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 and just, just yeah. for the people who don't remember, uh, don't remember their economics class from high school, it's basic supply and demand. When you have a lot of people wanting to buy and not enough houses, it pushes the prices up because people are competing to buy those homes. You know, and a, and a buyer's market would be the opposite. When you have too many homes for sale, like we did in the last recession, too many homes for sale, nobody wanted to buy, it pushed prices down. So this is, this really has I don't want to say nothing to do with the pandemic and the recession, but it's really just basic supply and demand, regardless of what's going on with those other factors. So yeah. if all of a sudden a lot of people wanted to sell and a lot of homes became available to sell, you know, this might slow down a little bit, but we're not saying that. We're saying more buyers than sellers continue. And I don't know that that trend is going to change anytime soon. Right. Well, and, and, you know, if we go back 30 days or 45 days, this would put us properties that went under contract, what, the middle of June? Or um, mm -hmm. that would be so like right around the 4th of July, actually. And look mm -hmm. at here, this is, this is like a 20% increase, 273 versus 235. That's what? Yeah. That's I mean, well, not 20%, but over over 10%. Yeah. So really and interesting. It's like, it's like what you see at auctions when people are bidding. I mean, that's what I'm seeing. I would say probably a good 75% of the deals I've been working on have been multiple offer situations. Right. Anytime a house goes for sale, there's instantly multiple offers. So if you think of just an auction, they say, you know, who wants to offer 200, 205, I'll take 210. You know, you're bidding it up. That's what happens when you have too many buyers and not enough homes. Right. Right, right. And then this last slide is just showing the rental prices. And it's kind of interesting too. just a quick look here, how much more volatile we are in 20. Than but overall, even if you average that volatility, pretty stable rental prices have not dropped or gone up, which is no. I, I was on an economic forecast thing with CoStar. Mm. Uh, like maybe two weeks ago and they and of course you know that's the commercial market those are the commercial guys and talking about large multifamily, you know 50 units buildings or more mm -hmm. um but you know the downtown rental market has just been hotter than a firecracker really and well it had it had been the last three years i mean right that the downtown rental market the luxury rental market downtown well what's interesting is that they're seeing that now starting to shift that market is finally right. starting to get a little softer and well um, i believe that the reason people want to live downtown is to be near all the festivals and concerts and the you know yeah. the nightlife and the fun activities and there's nothing happening right now so yeah well, i believe why would you pay the premium money. Right, and your prototypical person living downtown is living downtown. They probably, you know, get up in the morning, make a pot of coffee, go over to their, you know, their IT job, Google or wherever, where they get yeah. fed. <laughs> yeah, they have some downtown high-rise job, yeah. <laughs> right? And that's thing too, they don't have to be close to work, there's no nightlife, so. Right, yeah. So, but I think that, if, since that is specifically tied to the pandemic, I think that will yes. rebound. Definitely. I, don't, I think that's a, a slow, a soft. I don't know that it's going to be an ongoing trend that, or if it's just something that's happening because, you know, the rental yeah. market is not long term. It's a short term. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and maybe more people from the rental market. This is just hypothetical. I, I haven't seen any numbers on it, but maybe more people in the rental market are starting to buy because of the rates being low. You know, they were yes. not thinking about it right away. But once they started hearing about the rates, they thought, well, maybe this is a good time when they otherwise might have waited a couple more years. 
Yeah, a lot of people are making changes now rather than waiting for sure. They're making mm -hmm. more long-term plans. All right, should we get into our other topic for the day about the sure. uh, Ten Commandments of yes. Homeline? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thou shalt not change jobs when you're trying to get a mortgage. <laughs> Be With, <laughs> without asking your loan officer. Sometimes some of these things are okay, but you definitely want to check with your loan officer first because you do not want to kill the deal. And, and you know, the biggest temptation is to buy furniture because you want to prepare for your new home. So you go to a furniture store and they say, hey, we'll give you. 10% discount if you open a new credit card. Now you have a new credit card and $10,000 of debt, which may negatively affect your qualifications, one. Or two, even if it doesn't affect your qualifications, it may uh, delay your closing because now we have to confirm, you know, what is the credit card? What are the terms? What's the payment? So we can add it into your debt to income ratio. So yeah, any of these things, changing jobs, buying vehicles, moving money around, buying furniture, um, what are the rest of them? I know this is your chart. We have similar ones, but, um, uh, change bank accounts, co-sign on a loan, originate inquiries into your credit. Don't, don't, don't lie about income or expenses or debts or liabilities because <laughs> <laughs> big brother is watching. There are no Not as bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I always say, uh, only about 10, 10 to 20% of the mortgage process is about figuring out if someone can actually afford to pay the mortgage. The rest of it is all about preventing fraud and money laundering. People always say, why do you need so many papers? Why do we need to verify this and verify that? It's all about preventing fraud and money laundering because of the last crash. They don't want that to happen again. So that's, that's why there's so much extra paperwork. So they are very thorough about making sure everything is accurate. And some things people won't disclose and think we won't find out. Well, there are stalker systems that the underwriters know everything about you. Not really, they're not looking at your Facebook, but like public record systems, they'll say, oh, we see you own this other house that you didn't disclose. Well, it's all from public record. So, uh, so yeah, definitely be as open and forthcoming, disclose everything. Uh, but like this says, don't change anything. <laughs> Once you get approved, if you change things, it will change your approval. So, um, right. yeah. Well, and you had mentioned this morning when we were talking about this a little bit about the, the effect that the pandemic has had on people's yeah. ability to get financing. And yeah, there's definitely a few things. One is people's jobs and income. So a lot of people did get furloughed. So they, they didn't lose their job. They still have their job. They just weren't working for a period of time. So if you are furloughed, if you're not currently working, you cannot get a loan. You need to be actively working. But as soon as you go back to work, you can qualify right away. There doesn't need to be a waiting period. So as soon as you start your job, you can qualify and you're not penalized for that period of time you were off. We're not going to average your income over the year and, and assume it's lower because you weren't working. We'll take your full income. Um, so furloughed is one. Some people are getting uh, their pays cut. I've had clients get up to 20% a reduction in their salary, some of them temporary, some of them permanent, but that you have to take into account. Some people have reduced hours, um, reduced overtime. Let me add a couple more notes. Yeah, so that's, so anything that has changed with your job or income, again, make sure to be forthcoming about that. We don't wanna, uh, you know, find out at the last minute, oh, something changed because they will verify. They verify the income in the beginning of the process. And then the day of closing, they call your company again and say, hey, I wanted to verify they're still employed, their income is the same. So um, definitely if you've had any changes to income, that's something to uh, consider and discuss. Um, a couple of changes on the, on the debt side. So student loans, it's something we're seeing uh, across the board with the CARES Act. One of the things they said is they don't want people paying student loans right now uh, because they want to reduce people's hardship. If their income is down, they don't. They want to give them a break. So a lot of people, their student loan automatically went to zero payment. They didn't request it. They didn't have to do anything. We pull their credit report and it says zero student loan payment. In some cases, people didn't even know that happened. <laughs> um, but in any case, that does that can affect your qualifications. So definitely, I don't want to go into all the nuances of it. But, but, it, it has, but in a positive way or a negative way? Uh, it can be negative. It can be negative. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I can touch on it briefly without going too into in, in depth. But the, the monthly payment we use to qualify you for a student loan is different depending on the program. So if you have like 
I would say a, a vast majority, more than half of Americans are on some of these special programs. Like one of the most popular is called the income-based reduced program. So basically, if your income is lower, they do a calculation and say, based on your income, you can afford this much payment and that's your payment. And it's not a full payment that it would normally be. And so some loan programs allow us to qualify on that payment, some don't. But if you don't have a payment at all, they have to assume worst case scenario, which depending on the loan program, sometimes that's 1% of the balance. So if you have $100,000 of student loan, I know Mary, don't make your eyes pop out of your head. That is normal nowadays that a lot of people have that much student loan debt. But if you have 100,000 and we have to assume worst case on that payment, that's a $1,000 monthly payment you know, that we have to factor into your debt to income ratio. So if there's no payment showing on your credit report, that can hurt you. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't qualify, but we wanna review it to make sure that you don't have any surprises, especially if it changed. If you got pre-approved back when you had a payment, now you go find a house without re-reviewing that, you don't wanna have you know, an unpleasant surprise. Um, and then the third thing that I've been seeing a lot of, the CARES Act also allowed people to put their current mortgage in forbearance. Um, and this is really interesting because in the past, they, the government has done programs like this, but typically you have to prove you're in hardship. So if you lost your job, you can call, fill out some paperwork, say I have a hardship, prove to them you're in a hardship, and then you can do something like this. The CARES Act didn't require you to prove your hardship at all. They just said, Anyone could put your mortgage in forbearance. You don't have to make the payment. So all these people who were not in hardship put their loan in forbearance. Well, the promise was that that's not going to affect your credit score. And while that's true, that does not mean it won't affect your mortgage qualification. You cannot qualify for another mortgage while your mortgage, your current mortgage is in forbearance. That doesn't mean there isn't a workaround. You can reinstate your mortgage and pay. So let's say you skip three months. You can pay those three months, catch up, prove to us you paid it, and then qualify. Um, but again, those are the things you want to review before you start looking at houses. If you find the house you want to buy and you want to move forward on day one, and then we start to find there are these things that we didn't know up front, um, that causes problems. So definitely just anything you've changed about your finances in the past six months, be forthcoming and open about that. You know, if something happened, you were in hardship and you missed a payment here or there or something, just let us know because in the end, the underwriter is going to find out, you know, so we want to make sure that we're setting the loan up right that you're going to get approved. We don't want any surprises after you've already paid for the moving company and you're, you know, told your landlord you're moving house. So there yeah. are no secrets from the underwriter. The underwriter knows all. <laughs> they do. They do. Yeah. Yeah. And so sometimes some of these things are not a problem, but it's better to address them up front so we make sure they're not a problem or if we have to move things around, we can we can still get you in lined up to be able to qualify. Well, you know, I guess that's kind of the uh, the, the downside of the low interest rates and in, in that is while the interest rates are terrific, the ability to get a mortgage is just um you know, they really look at everything. They, they yeah. go through it all with the fine. I mean, no, to be honest, it's not terrible. So yes, they are going to be thorough. They're going to look at everything with a fine tooth comb, but it's not that hard to qualify for a mortgage. I really think people have a misconception that you have to have amazing credit, twenty percent down, and that's right. not the case. There are no, loan is programs. I mean, we we have programs that will help people with terrible credit. We have down payment assistance if you don't have any money. Um, so it, it is actually not. Difficult. I mean, I did. I about a month ago, I closed a guy who had a 566 credit score. Um, oh so I mean, it, it's, <laughs> not, like, if that guy walked into a cell phone store to get a cell phone, he probably would have gotten turned down because they pull your credit to get cell phones, and you know they're they're right. strict. They're strict. You know, so um, so I wouldn't say that people this should make people afraid because it is actually not terribly difficult to get a mortgage. If you have a job and stable income, um, you know, if you if you have challenge credit, we may be able to help. And if not, we'll point you in the right direction of what you need to do to get it there. If you don't have a lot of down payment, maybe you qualify for the down payment assistance program and you're fine. Or if not, we'll let you know how much you need to save. So in either case, we'll get you on the right path to home ownership. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't let these changes or anything else we just said discourage you from buying. You still want to look into it and see what you qualify for because a lot of people really do think it's much harder to qualify than, than it actually is. Yeah, I think maybe it's just a matter of setting expectations that just know that there are no, there are no secrets, so there's no point in not disclosing and 
being upfront and transparent about whatever your situation is. And, and if you get an expert like Marla who knows what to ask for and what documentation that she needs, she can, she can get it, you know, you can get it all done up front and you won't have any unhappy surprises. Yeah. No, and you're right that that is actually the biggest problem, that some loan officers, it's not that they did something wrong, it's just that they missed something. They didn't ask enough questions. They didn't find out, for instance, if someone pays child support, well, child support is part of your monthly debt, and that has to be factored in. So, you know, maybe they calculated everything else correctly, but they didn't ask that question and they missed it. And now the underwriter's looking at the pay stub and they can see that child support withdrawal coming right out. Oops, we missed it, right? So it's, it's really uh, about being thorough to not miss things. Um, and really, you know, as a loan officer, knowing the guidelines as much as the underwriter does, because I need to know what the underwriter is looking for to know if someone's qualified. Right. So exactly. yeah, really working with a knowledgeable loan officer, not saying it has to be me, but just making sure that the person you are working with um, knows uh, the underwriting guidelines, is very thorough, make sure that your pre-approval is actually worth gold. So, you know, once you go under contract, you know you're gonna close, you know. Sometimes there's problems not related to the loan, but you know, you have a, a high likelihood it'll close if you have a good pre-approval that is actually, you know, thoroughly reviewed. Well, I think it's like anything else, not only in the real estate business, but in the business world in general, that having having someone who's experienced and has been around the block a few times and knows what to you know, knows what the pitfalls are. Sure. Not things that you can be that can be taught in a classroom, sit in a licensing class. I mean, it's you know, it's just uh, a lot it's of just experience. So right. I mean, if I was getting brain surgery, I wouldn't want the guy that it was his first day on the job. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and they don't allow that guy to do the brain surgery. He gets, <laughs> he gets to be a resident for twelve years or whatever, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we don't need twelve years, but. At a couple of years would be good anyway. <laughs> At this point, I'm up to what? Uh, <laughs> two years I've been doing this. So yeah. if, uh, if somebody would like that that 10 commandments of home buying, <laughs> I could send it out. Um, just put your um, uh, private message me or Marla, and, and we'll be sure to get it over to you. And um, Jerry, do we have any questions? Do we have anything else we want to talk about? And I should mention, if there's a specific topic that you'd like Mar uh, Marla and I to discuss on next month's call, um, you know, send that over to us as well. We, we'd certainly love to field uh, questions and talk about what you'd like to talk about. Um, our next call is scheduled for always the fourth Monday in September, which the, uh, in September would be um, the fourth Monday of the month, which in September is September 28th, which I believe is Yom Kippur. So I don't know if we're going to run into a challenge. Oh. We may have to do it a little bit earlier. I had to look at the calendar. I was thinking it was going to be my birthday. My birthday is the Friday before. But if you guys want to send me birthday presents on our next call, I'm more than welcome to receive them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan to me. So, Jerry, do we have do we have any questions, or are we good? Nope, we're all good. Okay, all right, good. Well, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, stay tuned for next next month on uh, September twenty eighth for Mary and Marla's monthly market update. <laughs> Such a tongue twister. <laughs>